I'm Sandy Benton Plasters, and I'm the pastor of St. George's United Methodist Church. To those of you who are visitors for the first time, thank you for again for being with us. If you are lonely, you will find a warm companionship. Here in this sanctuary, wherever you are, in this sanctuary of hope, you can find a new seat at the table of life and feast yourself on love and fellowship. And you will not hunger for the touch of human hand or an embrace of your searching spirit. If you are afraid or if you have been abused, if you ache with fatigue, here you will find rest. You will be comforted, your spiritual wounds will be dressed, and your courage will be returned to you. You will be led beside the still waters, and your soul will be restored. If you seek to understand, here you will be encouraged in your search. Wonderful pathways will be lit unto you, and wherever your journeys take you, you will know that you can always come home again to this place made sacred for our love of you. This is a sanctuary of the soul. There are no boundaries in this cathedral of hope. The collective wisdom of all humankind and our painful but glorious history are open to you here. Your heart and your mind need never struggle with one another in a United Methodist congregation. We have no fear of science. We have no fear of knowledge here. If someday you decide to join us, you may feel this. All my life I have been wandering in the dark, but now I have found your hearts and am satisfied. And what do all the great words come to in the end but that? I love you. I am at rest with you. I have come home. Let, a, let love guide your path, for love is the holiest path of all. Will you pray with me? Holy God, we come this day into this sacred moment and in this sacred space, aware that your holiness is always around us. As Moses before us, when we turn aside from our daily tasks, and we listen for your holy voice, speak to us in holy mystery. Surround us with your wondrous love, that we might be wise enough to understand your call and be brave enough to follow your path. Amen. Good morning, my name is Amy and I'm the music director here at St. George's United Methodist Church. We're so grateful that you're here with us today. Today I'd like to share a song with you by special request from Pastor Sandy. And the name of the song is entitled, Pharaoh, Pharaoh. Headed to 
to the Red Sea with Pharaoh's army coming after me. I took my rod and stuck it in the sand and all of God's people walked on dry land. Oh, Pharaoh, Pharaoh, oh, baby, let my people go. Here it is. No. There it is. <laughs> Happy Sunday, everybody. Good morning. My name is Diana, and these are my children, Damien and Abigail. Hi. Hi. One of my favorite Bible verses begins, For God so loved the world. I was thinking about this verse and wondering, how great is God's love and how might we measure it? So we brought some tools with us today to see if we can use those tools to measure God's love. So Abigail, what do you have? I have a measuring cup. So a measuring cup is used when we bake. We might use it to measure flour or milk or sugar. So I wonder if we can use a measuring cup to measure God's love. Well, the Bible says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. My cup runneth over. Well, if the cup runs over, do you think that's a good way to measure God's love? No. Mm -mm. Yeah, probably not. I wonder if there's something else we can use. Damien, what do you have? I have measuring tape. So measuring tape is often used when we're doing some sort of building. So you can use it to measure how long something is, how tall or how wide or how deep it is. So I wonder if we can use a measuring tape to measure God's love. The Bible tells us that God's love is higher than the heavens. Well, I don't think that measuring tape will reach all the way up to the heavens. What do you guys think? No way. No way. So there's one other tool I brought today to see if we can use it to measure God's love, and it is... A watch. So watches are used to measure time. So I wonder if we can use a watch to measure God's love. The Bible tells us that God's love is from everlasting to everlasting. So we probably can't use a watch to measure God's love if it's everlasting. What do you think? Mm, nah. So how do you measure a love so great? Well, the answer is you don't measure it. You have to experience it. So my prayer for you today is that you understand how long, how wide, how deep, and how high God's love is for you. So let's all pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love, a love so great that you gave your one and only Son so that we could have eternal life. Amen. Amen. Hello, I'm C.P. Watkins. The word of the Lord from Exodus, chapter 3, the first 15 verses. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight, and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, 
God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Come no closer. Remove the sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings, and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you, and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. But Moses said to God, If I come to the Israelites and say to them, The God of your ancestors has sent me to you, and they ask me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. He said further, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, I am has sent me to you. God also said to Moses, Thus you shall say to the Israelites, The Lord, the God of your ancestors, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my title for all generations. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thine sight. Amen. Well, friends, we have been together two months. And this is our last week for a little while in the Old Testament. And we have been journeying through the Old Testament. And here we come to Moses, the burning bush, one of the most popular well-known scripture passages. People know about the burning bush, even if they don't know about the Bible, they've heard about the burning bush. And as we finish up this series in the Old Testament, I'd like us to think about call, the call on our lives, or the vision God has for our lives, because we talk about it sometimes in terms that are very broad and very vague. But I think it's important for us to know that we are all, each and every one of us, called by God. And a call is something much larger than a simple task or a goal. It is an overarching theme in our lives that we may not realize until much later in our lives that this is what God was using me for all along. Now, all of us are called, and we're called to help move forward the saving grace of God. Now, we can't give people grace or give them the experience of grace, but we can help them and ourselves be ready to experience God's grace because you and I know there are so many things that get in the way of grace. Sometimes it's us, sometimes it's the world around us, sometimes it's other people, but all of us are called to help move grace forward, to help in the plan of salvation, to continue to grow disciples in deeper relationship with Christ, ourselves, others in our church, and the world around us. So that's what I'd like us to talk about this morning. Now Moses was called, and he had 
not only a calling on his life, but he had a couple of tasks that he needed to do as a part of that calling. He was called to save the Israelite people, to save God's chosen people. A huge calling. Well, in order to do that, there were several steps, several tasks, several projects, if you will, that were a part of Moses' life. Now, the first one was just surviving infanthood, infancy. Remember, Pharaoh had ordered all of the Israelite male babies to be killed. And so Moses, just surviving childhood, allowed him to help keep the Israelites alive. He had children. He forwarded the next generation. He didn't have a lot to do with saving himself. But other people helped with that project. Other people help us as well with the projects that are a part of our life, that are a part of our calling. Then we come to this passage. And Moses is happy. He seems content. He's just living his life. He's shepherding the sheep for his father-in-law. He's married. He has children. He's just in the midst of living. And in the midst of his living, God calls. And God gets Moses' attention with this burning bush. I wonder how many times we have been so wrapped up in our ordinary lives that we don't see the burning bushes. That we miss the call of God because we're too busy with our head down and just living our lives. Moses sees the bush. And he looks away. Perhaps we look away too because sometimes we're afraid. I don't know what I'd do with a burning bush if I saw it. How do you handle that? Sometimes we do that with things seem too big for us. We just look away. We see things in our society that need to change. And we think, I'm, I'm not cut out for this. It's too big a job for me. I can't really make a difference, so I'm just going to do nothing. Look away. But God calls out to Moses, and God tells Moses to take his shoes off. Remember that. We're going to get back to the shoes in a minute. But so this taking his shoes off, here listening to the voice of God, this is all a part of saving the Israelite people. Now, taking your shoes off doesn't seem like a big task, and it doesn't seem like it's going to save the Israelite people, but sometimes it's only in hindsight that we know how God is using events in our lives. So he takes his shoes off. He's on holy ground. And God tells Moses that God has heard the Israelites' cry of oppression and that God is going to save the Israelites through Moses. Moses doesn't feel like a leader. And I don't think it's false humility. I think it's truly being afraid of what it means to be a leader because what does he know? And we'll see this throughout the rest. If we continued on in Moses' life, we see that Moses goes to God time and again saying, I don't know what to do with these people. Maybe you've done that. I don't know what to do with these children of mine, these parents of mine, these friends of mine. I just don't know what to do. That's a good place to start. It's a good place to let God speak in our midst. Well, so Moses 
is there. He has thought that he could handle things on his own because remember earlier in his life he killed an Egyptian guard for abusing an Israelite. He thought he could take care of it and he learned he couldn't take care of it. This is part of the reason he ends up with Jethro. Well, we are a lot like Moses. We have a calling on our life that sometimes we like to forget we have. We think we know what to do, how to do it, but we don't really. We're scared when God speaks to us because we think the task that God has for us, this calling on our lives is too big for us, too broad for us. We are just us. Remember I told you to, to stay with the idea of Moses taking his shoes off, taking off his sandals. Now, when you take off your sandals, you're exposed. In Japanese culture, it's a sign of respect. So when you would go into a person's house, you would take your shoes off. In some houses here, people do that. I don't know that it's necessarily a respect, more out of cleanliness. But Moses took his shoes off. And there he was before God, vulnerable. Just him. No pretense. No shoes. He was just in the presence of God in a sacred space. We need to be in the presence of God as well. We need to stay in sacred spaces more often instead of rushing to and from the places we go in our ordinary lives, the things we need to do, the tasks that need to get done to get us through the day. It's hard sometimes. Because there's so many places to go and so many things to do, we don't have time to take our shoes off. Much less sit in a space, be in a space. But I encourage you to think about ways you can be in sacred space. Maybe that sacred space is here in our church. We're getting ready to come back to in-person worship. And I want to encourage you to read the plan. It's on our website. And... We can um, email you a copy if you need one, but we have a plan for coming back into worship. We are um, hopeful that our first Sunday in worship will be the first Sunday of October. But even if you can't be in this sacred space, maybe there is room in your house for sacred space, a place where God is uniquely welcome. And maybe if you don't have a whole room to dedicate to sacred space, you have a candle, a chair, a place where you can light that candle and focus on that candle and know that God is present. So Moses is in his sacred space. And he hears God's call on his life. He hears that God wants him to save the Israelite people. Save a whole nation. I don't think we're really up for the task. At least not on our own. But with God, we have the power to do, live out our purpose. God is going to equip us with everything we need to do the work we are called to do. Give us the skills, the energy, the talents, put people in our paths that can help us. We have to trust in God rather than trusting in ourselves. We have to listen to that theophany, that word of God when God speaks to us know that God is going to empower us to do the work of the kingdom. 
You know, some of us lack self-confidence. A lot of us probably lack self-confidence. We want to be better, different, more or less of something. But what if we were able to realize that God calls us just as we are, where we are in life, how we are, and God can use all the parts of that. Look at Moses in the beginning of his life when he's being sent down the river in a basket. He can't do anything. He's a helpless baby. But God used a helpless baby to save the Israelite people. You may feel helpless, ill-equipped, but God can use you to save God's people. There is a story, an old Hasidic story, about the awareness of being oneself. Rabbi Zuza, when he was an old man, said, In the world to come, they will not ask me, Why were you not more like Moses? Rather, they will ask me, Why were you not more like Zuza? You are uniquely and wonderfully made, and God has a call on your life. God is going to empower you to live out your purpose. Our job is to trust God. And this calling on our life, it's a big thing. It's not a small thing. This, this helping other people be saved is a huge thing undertaking and we may feel ill equipped but God believes that us all of us who are followers of Jesus work together for the kingdom of God and as we work together the world is changed the world is transformed to be more fully the place God has created it to be and in this vision this call there are projects there are goals Moses had several he was to lead the Israelites out of Egypt, which he did. Then he was to lead them to the promised land. Four-day journey took 40 days, but he did it. Sometimes our whole lives are spent on one project. Sometimes there are little projects all along the way. Our job is to trust that God knows what God is doing. One thing that's going to happen, it's going to happen for me because we're recording on Thursday, but for you on Sunday, it's already happened because it's happening tomorrow, the March on Washington, commemorating um, Dr. King's iconic speech, I Have a Dream speech, remembering how people in 1963 marched for racial injustice they marched for equality. They marched so that we would know that there was a calling for our country to change. A calling not just from one voice, but from hundreds of thousands of voices. They're expecting tens of thousands on this march, a virtual march for most people because of the pandemic, but they're expecting people to come together for racial injustice, to work against racial injustice, for criminal justice reform and police reform. These are the goals according to CNN. Lofty goals, but a much larger calling because these goals are to bring awareness, but there's still a lot to do in our country, in the world, to fight against injustices, racial or otherwise. We need to be more like Moses, to know that we have a purpose, to claim that purpose on our lives, and to trust that God will empower us to do the work of the kingdom. 
as we get ready for September and fall, and all of the wonderful things that autumn brings, let us consider our lives. Are we living for a large purpose or are we simply taking one task at a time, not really thinking about our larger purpose? God has a vision for our lives, for each of us. And we need to accept that vision and work towards that vision, that calling over our lives. It may be a simple word like empowerment to empower other people. It may be justice, to work for justice. No matter what the word is, no matter what the call is, God is using that to bring people to salvation so that people may experience the saving grace of God. We mentioned racial injustice already, and we know that people who are oppressed are busy being oppressed. They can't really focus on other things when they have such a hard time just dealing with the everyday thing. We know that when we bring justice, when lives are equal, that people are more free to experience God's grace, to grow in God's grace, to be more fully what they were called to be by God. Each one of us each and every one of us has a calling on our lives from God. God offers us a choice to accept that call or to refuse that call. God will empower us and give us all the gifts, the skills, the talents we need to reach those goals which will lead to fulfilling that calling. I invite you to claim the call on your life, to live out those goals, and to trust that God is with us. Just as God was with Moses on that mountain in the burning bush, so God is within us. And God uses us and burns brightly within our spirits so that we will not be consumed by the power of God, but be transformed. Will you pray with me? Holy God, as we sit in this moment of sacred worship, breathe your Holy Spirit within us. Speak to us in the silence. Reveal your presence in the fire of love that burns in our own spirits. Show us your holy path that we may move forward in confidence and courage. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.
Today we have a number of prayer concerns. I'd like to ask you to pray for our congregation as we move forward to return to in-person worship. We ask that we will be able to do this guided by the wisdom of God and the directions through of our protocol that can be found, like I said, online or they can be emailed to you. We also want to pray for Joan McDonald, Joe and Alice Howe, Jack Whalen, Cindy Whalen's brother-in-law. I want to pray for all of his family since he passed away. And we want to pray for one another that we will be empowered to live out our purpose. Let us first bless our students. Scripture reminds us that teachers are a gift from Christ himself to the church. Learning is a gift. Let us pray for those returning to being students. Lord, we ask your blessing on those students returning to school, those students who are in grade school or high school. We pray your blessings on them as they learn some in a very new way. We pray your blessings that they will be well equipped with equipment, with a hunger for learning, and with patience for new technology. We pray that you will offer them the support and care they need. We pray for their socialization, that even as they are at home, they may find ways to connect with peers, teachers, and others. We pray that you will bless the children, that they may be open to the insights, not only of their teachers in school, but of those who surround them. May they become more aware of your love. We ask that you bless them, keep them, guide, guard, and protect them. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now let us pray for our joys and concerns. Holy God, it's so easy to get caught up in day-to-day -day living. There are so many things to do, so many tasks to complete. But you call us to a larger life than that. You call us to a purpose and a vision. Thank you, Lord, for entrusting us with more than ordinary tasks. As we come together, we pray for one another in our need. We pray for those who are hurting, suffering, whether in body, mind, or spirit. We pray for those who are struggling, those who feel alone, those who are grieving, those who feel lost in the darkness. We pray that your light will shine upon each one of us, that we may fully realize your grace, your light burning within us, your light burning in others around us. Let us grab hold of the grace which you so freely offer that we may be more fully called to your purpose. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Offering our gifts to God is a holy act. In this sacred moment, let us offer our gifts and our lives to the holy work of God. Will you pray with me? In gratitude for your amazing works in the world, we offer our gifts to further your work, Holy One. Bless us as you blessed Moses before us, that we may be a blessing of your holy work. Guide our steps and bless the offerings we bring that the world may be touched by your holy love. Amen. Good morning. Thank you for joining us at St. George's United Methodist Church. My name is Amy. I'm the music director here at our church. 
This morning we're going to be singing from the Faith We Sing book, 2173, Shine, Jesus, Shine. If you have a Faith We Sing at home, you're welcome to turn to that. And if not, don't worry, the words will be on the screen in front of you. We're going to sing all three stanzas. Amen. 